All right, everyone, welcome. Hello. Hi. Hello. Quit your fellowshipping. <laughs> Bunch of Calvinists. Um, all right, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming to Wordsmith. Thanks for coming to this uh, event. This is something we've tried to do, um, have a discussion connection with uh, social in, in years past. It's been well received, so appreciate you coming. Um, as you know, Michael Ward is visiting here with us, and I want to begin our discussion by uh, uh, with a pedestrian question. What, what are you working on now? What book projects are you working on now? And how do they relate to what you've put in print already? Thank you. I'm just finishing uh, editing a book of presentations about C.S. Lewis, which were delivered in England on the 50th anniversary of his death back in November 2013. Um, there was a big event to memorialize C.S. Lewis in Westminster Abbey, in that part of Westminster Abbey, which is called Poets' Corner where all the great men of, and women of English letters are either buried or memorialized. I, ha I had actually the great honor of arranging this memorial and unveiling it on the 50th anniversary of his death, um, one of the great privileges of my life. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a symposium at the Abbey. There were conferences that same week in both Oxford and Cambridge. And so I've assembled all these presentations under one cover, and that's going to be called C.S. Lewis at Poets Corner. Uh, and that's coming out with Whip and Stock later this year or early yeah. next year. And of course that all relates to my previous work on C.S. Lewis. Um, I edited the Cambridge Companion to C.S. Lewis a few years ago. My main book is Planet Narnia. Um, and then I wrote a kid brother version of Planet Narnia called The Narnia Code. Um, but the very first book I ever wrote or edited actually was um, a book called Heresies and How to Avoid Them. <laughs> why it matters what Christians believe, uh, which has done surprisingly well, actually. It's been taken up and used in various courses in, in Britain and in America uh, for uh, church history, church doctrine. It's been a surprising success, that book. Okay. Well, good. Um, the, the place I wanted to start was uh, something came up in our, our session earlier today, in our Q&A session, about the nature of metaphorical language. Are, are metaphors simply ornaments on the top of raw knowledge, like vanilla yogurt and frozen yogurt, and then the M&Ms are the metaphors that you put on top and you could dispense with? Are they ornamental only? Are they more um, substantive than that? And uh, we, we just touched on it briefly, and so I wanted to open that question up again and maybe pursue it a little further and ask you to comment on that first. What, what do you think the nature of uh, language is? is and, and what extent is it metaphorical? How does that work? And then, Nate, if you comment on that. Yeah, well, I, I don't have very much more to add to what we were saying this afternoon, but um, it will hopefully bear repeating because it's, it's very interesting, very important. But uh, at any rate, in C.S. Lewis's view, um, which I think is pretty sound, pretty well-reasoned, um, all language, as soon as you get beyond pointing to individual sensible objects, is, is necessarily, fundamentally, incurably metaphorical. We apprehend none of these super sensible things except through metaphor. As soon as you start talking about states of mind and relationships and um, things that are metaphysical, you need metaphor. You need to carry over from the, the concrete observable physical experience to something which is more notional, more spiritual, more intellectual, um, more abstract, uh, and you, you need metaphors in order to do all those things. So when, let's say you, you're at the rudimentary level of pointing at something with a stick, grunting and pointing. Mm. When you get to the second one of those, yep. you're having to think, this is like, the second one is like the first one in some respects. Yes and this third object is not like it at all, all of a sudden you're in the realm of comparison, sorting, shaking things out. Yeah. Right? Yep. So the example I gave this afternoon, and I can't now think of a better one, um, is uh, the metaphor of being under the weather. Right. You know what it is like to stand under a rain cloud in the open air and get wet and feel cold. Uh, and then from that concrete, tangible, palpable experience, you, you transfer the, the meaning of that to some other situation when you're not actually under a literal cloud, but you're feeling low, you're feeling grey, you're indoors, you're not actually being rained upon, but you're feeling miserable. You're, 
and you are under the weather. That is a metaphor. Right. So one, uh, let's talk for a minute about the versatility of metaphors. So I, uh, one of the examples I use when I'm uh, teaching on uh, communication or languages, uh, idioms, idiomatic expressions. So if you were talking to a, uh, an international student, let's say a Chinese student who just got off the plane and his English was good but it was all classroom English and he had his little dictionary with him and he says to you one mon Monday morning, how was, how was your weekend? And you say, I was pretty good, I was under the weather. And he thinks, <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was uh, beside myself. Yeah, <laughs> I was down in the dumps. Uh, down in the dumps. You know, cabin fever, I had cabin fever. <laughs> what do you, what do you I was climbing the walls, right? <laughs> you know, stir crazy. I was going around the bend. I was around the bend. <laughs> I was tearing my hair out. <laughs> you, know, you, you could go on for five minutes. Yeah. And a native speaker would say, yes, yes, those are identical, identical. That was almost, and they all have ranges of semantic meaning, yeah. and none of them are literal. Yes. You know, the, uh, one of the other funny things is that um, one of the things I do in my spare time is, is uh, read dictionaries. And <laughs> that is a funny thing. <laughs> and said, Another funny thing. <laughs> I read dictionaries. Well, uh, but this, I, there was one dictionary, I read, and some of them are dictionaries of slang, and, and I, but there was a dictionary I once read, and I learned this an amazing fact that there are some, there's an activity, getting drunk, that virtually anything is metaphorically apt. Hmm. See, now you're stealing what I was going to say. <laughs> I learned this without a dictionary. <laughs> I, was, I remember telling my sisters, your daughters, this long ago that you could use anything in context. Anything could be made to, to mean, mean somebody was drunk. Yes. He's in the corner running for Congress. <laughs> <laughs> He's in the corner polishing the silver. Yeah. <laughs> he put on a snowsuit and headed north. <laughs> yeah, just, it doesn't. Yeah. Because it's such a nonsensical state. Any piece of nonsense can be yes. can be, can be a, to us, but, yeah. but right. I, I think to, to pile in that thing is that's beautiful. First, you know, it could be any number unless the metaphor is known to mean an idiom is known to mean something else. Right, it can be used to mean that somebody is is tipsy, completely right. tipsy. Three sheets to the wind. Yeah, just there it is. But I think the metaphor, like the nature metaphor, runs a lot, runs even more deeply than just human communication, but. Humans are themselves metaphors. Like, I am a metaphor. I'm, I'm either a, a good one or a bad one. I'm inferior or improving. You know, there could be superiority of metaphor. What is fatherhood? Fatherhood is a metaphor. Human fatherhood is a meta metaphor for divine fatherhood. Right. Uh, we well, are the image of God. What's an image? We're told that. What, what is that? It's like, it's metaphorically, this is, what, this is what God's like. Christ is the perfect one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he says. And, we should be in a place where we can say, if you've seen me, you've seen Christ. And uh, obviously, we can't quite say that. <laughs> but um, that's the goal. So that's the, the nature of Or you of could say it, and if people challenge you, you could say, well, I was just being metaphorical. <laughs> just, <laughs> and we all know that doesn't mean anything. Um, so so there, there's, a, I mean, there's a way in which I think you can look at any corner of God's creation, any piece of it, and know that it is reflective of something. It's, it's a sign of something. It's, it has, it's a, you know, there's, there's So a is this reference. another way of saying that there is no such thing anywhere as an uninterpreted fact? There's, there's no well, I raw, say unrelated. There's no raw data yeah. anywhere. Every, yeah. every fact, every pebble, on, you know, so you go up to the Arctic and there's a pebbled beach and the waves are sloshing on the pebbled beach and no human being has been there for thousands and thousands of years, and God's been just sloshing the beach, doing this over and over. And there, you take, pick one pebble, that pebble has an interpretation. It has meaning, because God understands it. Well, because it has a relationship, it has, it has connectivity. And so it's not waiting for you to apply the meaning to it, it is similar to other things. Right. It is like in kind to other things, and it is uh, it has many many aspects of it that are true comparisons would be true comparisons which are there to be discovered and pointed out and mm. it's laden it's laden with metaphor because it exists in this world created by the one artist who frequently repeated himself there's all these patterns and loops and 
and so on. So eyeballs and all sorts of different creatures. And, you know. I think it was Alastair McIntyre, the British philosopher, who said that facts are an invention of the 18th century. <laughs> you know, brute facts, supposed yeah. raw data. That's an invention of the 18th century. Nobody thought like that before, and we should stop thinking like that now because right. it's it's a it's a trick played on us by a, a certain kind of thinker who wants us to uh, operate entirely upon their own premises. Right. They want autonomous knowledge without reference to God. Yeah. They want to stand on this invisible balcony, bolted to who knows what and look down on the world yes. and assign meaning. Yeah. And it's just not possible. We also want, we've confused precision with accuracy. So we think in, in that age, the age of brute facts, we, want, we have to reduce something, reduce something, reduce something until it means nothing else. Yeah. It means just this one thing. But someone could write you a limerick about how cold it was that evening and have it more accurate than somebody else saying it was 17 degrees Fahrenheit. It was, it was 17 degrees. On this scale, the Fahrenheit one, have you ever seen a degree? Well, there were 17 of them. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever counted to 17? That's how many degrees <laughs> we're milling about. Oh, now Outside. I know how cold it was. Yeah, exactly. exactly. This informs me a great deal, yeah. as opposed to somebody else who says, you know, and, yes. and tells oh, you. Oh, bitter chill it was. Yeah, exactly. Yes. That's, um, Keats and Agnes yeah. Eve, yeah. Yeah, it's numbed with the beadsman's fingers. Yes. I think is that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. So that piece is uh, is a, is a quite an accurate description. And Richard else. Dawkins would say, "What's the beadsman got to do with it? <laughs> yeah. why, why him? Why not somebody?" Well, because uh, Christian thinking is uh, attracted to the concrete, to the particular. So Jesus went to Nazareth High. He, his family had a. A place in the phone book. Uh, you know, he had a graduating year. He had a class. Jesus graduated with a class. He had a hometown with a water tower and and he had a mom. So, so the Christian view is this particular man with ten fingers and ten toes is universal truth. You know, Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." And, what is truth, Pilate says, and, and truth is standing right in front of him. And there, that, I can't imagine a more fundamental collision between autonomous knowing, uh, autonomous humanistic knowing, and God's love affair with particularity. And as soon as you, but as soon as you go particular, you can't go, you can't make it get anywhere unless you say, and, unless you start hopping. You, c you come down to one particular fact, hmm. and now you, it's like rocks in the middle of a stream. You've got to hop from rock to rock to get anywhere. And even, well, even in the example of 17 degrees, what, what on earth is a degree? It's, it's still a metaphor. It's just, it, it's behaving metaphorically. It's just less effective in, in communicating the sensation or the, the, the actual concept of cold. <laughs> because especially if you get into the negatives. <laughs> but as soon as you're saying, do you know what a degree is, and everybody acts like they do, and they don't, what is it? It's, you know, it's an arbitrary thing, but there's 17 of them. So you say, there's actually, and we're missing five. <laughs> so if you want to know how cold it is, we have five degrees have gone missing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fairly hopeless. But it's, so that kind of, in modernism, we love to reduce, we love to quantify, we love to attempt tiny, tiny precision and to count well, here, here. instead of to, to grab with metaphor and imagery. So I think, I think metaphor runs at an experience or at information at what we would call facts with open arms. You know, tries to, tries to grab it, tries to corral it and qualify. You know, it's like this, not like that. You know, it, it qualifies it and collects it like a net as opposed to trying to touch it with a needle. So uh, let me, it might look like I'm changing the subject, but I'm not really. I, I assume that over the over the years, you've graded many papers, right? So, uh, and uh, much purgation. <laughs> yes, and this is why he's such a holy man now. <laughs> um, so, uh, here's here's an example of how modernity has us by the throat. Um, when you're grading a paper, it makes sense to me if you're giving a Latin test and you have a hundred Latin words on there, and someone misses seven of the words. It makes sense to me why I would give him a 93. So 
out of 93, out of 100 possible correct answers, you got 93 correct, and so your paper is like 93 is to 100. That makes sense mm -hmm. to me. But if I, if this assignment was, please write a paragraph describing a sunset on the Pacific Coast, over on the Oregon Coast, mm. and they write me an essay, and I write 93 on the top of that. What on earth do I think I? <laughs> <laughs> what do I think I'm talking about? What I'm saying is 93, 93 is to 100. What this essay is to what? Yeah. Uh, the essay Jesus would have written? <laughs> the, the essay Plato had in mind? What, what am I comparing it to? I, I'm, just talking, I'm just talking nonsense, right? And so, uh, and then, if, uh, here's another angle, and I ask you for grading stories, I guess. I've, uh, if I wrote 90, let's say the demarcation between an A minus and an A is 92 to 93. If I write 92 on there, I'll get grade nerds who come up and argue for the one point. Mm. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> oh, they exist. They exist. <laughs> <laughs> I so have met them. Yes. You've met them. They're yes. over in England, too. Yes. Right? So, so you're dealing with grade nerds. And then, but if I wrote on the essay, this was very, very good. <laughs> Nobody ever argues with me and says, why didn't you say, why weren't there three varies? Mm. <laughs> Why did I just get two varies? <laughs> well, it's because I'm communicating in prose to him, and but he wants to cash it out to the real meaning, which is the numerical meaning, yeah. right? And yeah. then there's the students have this absolute genius for having all their numbers average out at the end of the semester to 92.4, <laughs> and that they're walking the line, and then they're arguing at the end of the semester, and you can oftentimes shut the argument down by opening the grade book up and showing them the row of numbers. And they say, oh, you know, math is math. <laughs> but, but every one of those numbers you made up out of your head. <laughs> right? Every, yeah. every one of them. So I guess the, the question is, but we're enthralled to mathematics. We, yep. we think that numbers have authority. So I, uh, where's the question in that? The question is, <laughs> does this resonate with <laughs> Does this resonate with your experience also? <laughs> yes, it does. Th though it must be said that until fairly recently in the university where I teach in Oxford, um, the, the, the idolization of, of numerical values had not completely r ruled the roost. It had not completely taken over. Um, when I was a student 25 years ago, and, and possibly this is still the case, um, though it's being subtly undermined, uh, you did not get a numerical grading on your paper. You got a, an alphabetical one. Uh, and it was indeed a alphabetical in the Greek sense. You got an alpha or a beta, or if it, it might have been a, an alpha beta, or it might have been an alpha beta beta, or even a beta alpha alpha, <laughs> or possibly a beta double plus alpha, or a beta question mark minus. Is this like North by Northwest? <laughs> <laughs> And this is actually true. This is how it worked. Um, and it was meant to be somehow more subtle, more humane than a, a crude numerical figure. <laughs> and I think it possibly was, because it had certain subtleties, certain, a certain suppleness, whereby uh, the examiner or your tutor could award you an alpha gamma. <laughs> which is an unusual mark, but quite a possible one within this system. And it would mean that it was brilliantly um, kind of conceived, uh, conceived or enunciated, <laughs> but the content was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, something like, it, it might have been the other way around. The content was great, but it was awfully expressed. Um, and that's actually, you, 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 I don't see how you could easily express that numerically. No, you could. No. no. See, um. in, in graduate school, I was at a school in Maryland, which would not give you your grades, would not give you your, your, your GPA, your numerical values, which I appreciated. And instead you'd receive a letter from the president inviting you to continue in the program. <laughs> or a letter notifying that you would no longer be continuing the program. <laughs> <laughs> and in the letter they would describe the feedback given to them by the professors that it had to. So the professors would relay 
comments, and you get a letter from the president in which those comments appeared. And by law, by federal law, they had to keep a numerical grade and give it to you if you asked. <laughs> but this, is, this was the baseline. They began with this. Hmm. And the thing that was funny is how astounded many of my classmates were when I was thrilled to never ask. Mm. I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea what the number was when I received my master's. I don't know what the GPA was. I, don't, I had no clue. Yeah. I know that I was on the watch list. <laughs> 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 After certain misbehaviors. Uh, but that was, that was it. I think it was misbehaviors in the theology course, actually, yeah. about the Gospel of Matthew. In fact. <laughs> but it was... But uh, yeah, tisk tisk. But I loved it. I really loved that. And the fact, if you went to any other school and said, "How would you feel if you had a letter from the president describing your your performance? You know, full page describing your performance this semester or this year?" They would all be thrilled. And then you say, "But we take away the number," mm -hmm. and then the panic sets in. Yeah. So it's it's very it's it's a it's a placebo. It's a very deceptive placebo. People think that you've said something. If you say 83 or 89, they believe communication has happened and therefore it has, even though or we think Or we think it's possible so. to go to a university and get three credits in sociology, as though it's like getting three yards of wool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many sociologists do you have? Three. <laughs> <laughs> Almost that. That might work for idiosyncrasies or... Yeah, we, three of them makes some sense, but and so this is another delusion of the modern mind, where we think that by describing something, we have explained it, right? So, yeah. like, uh, the like, so like the stars, or um, or like the or seahorses, uh, for that matter, <laughs> <laughs> or anything. Yeah, well, my favorite example is the rate of acceleration. You know, uh, nine point eight meters per second squared. Um, all we're doing is describing what happens. If you ask the typical modern man, what makes things, if I drop my phone or if I drop my car keys, what makes it go down? They would say gravity. But gravity is simply our name for things going down. Yes. Right. <laughs> right? There's not this thing called gravity that reaches up and grabs it and pulls it down. Yeah. Um, there's nothing in between these objects. Right? It's action, one mass acts on another mass from a distance, and we have described the rate at which it happens with great precision, and it's remarkably consistent, and so we <laughs> describe it and therefore think we've explained it. Right? So uh, why, why, is it, why is it raining? Well, there's a low pressure area and a high pressure area. Yeah. No, I asked why is it raining? <laughs> because Jesus wants it to rain. <laughs> <laughs> Get back under the weather immediately. <laughs> and so, all those things are valuable if, if all you want to do is quantify and put things into operation. I mean, like this, this thing that we're alluding to, Lewis's essay called The Language of Religion, where he, he talks about there are 13 degrees of frost, or you could say it's very cold, or you could say, ah, bitter chill it was. Uh, how numb were the beadsman's the fingers? Owl the owl for all his feathers was a cold, yeah. etc. Uh, so you've got scientific language, you've got ordinary language, you've got poetic language, and they all have their uses. Uh -huh. It is occasionally useful to be able to say there were 13 degrees of frost because then, if that is like an accurate thermometer reading, you know that there, there are going to be certain predictable effects upon plant life and animal life, and you can take action on that, right. which is useful. I like flying on airpl airplanes that were built by engineers who love decimal points. Yes, <laughs> me too. <laughs> and that's all good Me, I want to go on poet air. <laughs> <laughs> See how that goes. Fly on the wings of Mercury. Yeah. <laughs> um, Icarus Express. <laughs> <laughs> but if all, if all you want is the practical application um, in the realm of quantifiable um, terms, then th that's fine. But the, the problem becomes when that over overextends its boundaries and begins to seep into the realm of, of quality because you can't express qualities through quantities um, obliquely related to all this how do you think I, this is a question of how do you think C.S. Lewis pulled it off if you th indeed think he did in uh, in the discarded image and then uh, 
there's a shorter version of the discarded image, an essay form of that in um, medieval and Renaissance. What? Studies in medieval Studies, Renaissance yeah. literature. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, there's a cheat sheet version of it and then discarded image. And then the discarded image it undergirds everything in the trilogy. So it's, um, and what Lewis does in the trilogy, it seems to me, is retain medieval cosmology without getting into, without, a, uh, without uh, telling us why the spaceship doesn't run into the spheres, for example, or mm. um, he's without, not, without pulling a full Charles Williams. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, never go full Charles Williams. <laughs> so he, he sort of, at the end of Discarded Image, he says, well, this is a beautiful, elegant system that has the disadvantage of not being true. Um, but I get this feeling that Lewis retained and, and believed as objective truth a great deal about the medieval cosmology, dispensing with things like geocentricity and, uh, you know, and actual physical spheres, but retaining, um, retaining sort of a recognizable form of it in mm. the modern world. First, mm. do you think that that's true, that Lewis retained, was he, he called himself an old Western man. Do you think he was that over against modern man in the, in the basic rudiments, and if you think he was, how do you think he did in pulling it off? Golly. Um, well, I think uh, he, uh, he, he was an old Western man, not in the sense that he wanted us to return to the, the pre-Copernican model of the cosmos. I mean, he says that very clearly in the discarded image. I am, I am not, of course, uh, advocating a return to the Aristotelian model. It, it had many disadvantages, and we now know a lot that our forebears did not know. <coughs> but that slightly misses the point, he says, that one of the reasons for retaining an awareness of that old discarded image of the cosmos is that it gives us something to set against the modern contemporary Einsteinian model of the cosmos. And because we've got something to set against the Einsteinian cosmos, we are hopefully uh, prevented from treating it with undue seriousness, as if it were a uh, yeah, as if it were a final statement of reality, we would begin, in that case, to idolize it. We would begin to see it as a catalogue of ultimate realities, when in fact it is, a, it is an account of what we see, which has many truths worked into it, and may yet become more true as, as further discoveries are made, but is never actually going to contain all the possible truths that could be incorporated into it, because that is only seen in the mind of God. So, uh, one of the things that Lewis apparently retained, and, and uh, even in your world, my son, that's not what a star is, that's only what it's made of. Right? Mm. Um, so, uh, stars have bodies and stars have souls and minds. You know, it, so, it seems to me that Lewis is retaining and advancing and arguing for, or arguing against the idea of a materialistic universe where the only soulish bits are in human beings. Mm. Everything else is empty cosmos, punctuated with dead rock and flaming gas, right? So Lewis really believed that the heavens were a celestial dance, mm. right? Yeah. Full of sentience and awareness and mm. worship. And yeah, purposes and, and signifiers and yeah. yeah. I mean, he's arguing against the impersonality of it all. Right. You know, the, the whole H.G. Wells and forward, you know, even when they had alien life, or life out there, it was biological just like we are. Mm -hmm. And it was the denial of the immaterial world that was sort of the thing he took up. It seems like the, the, the denial of the soul, right. of space, of the, of the heavens. And we, we are crippled oftentimes, particularly in the States, conservative evangelical believers are crippled in that we're taking a last ditch stand, sort of like a spiritual Alamo, where def we're defending the human soul against the onslaughts of secularism, having seeded a soullessness mm. in the whole rest of the cosmos mm. to them. So we'll say to Dawkins, well, everything out there is just exactly what you say it is. Mm. Impersonal matter grinding. grinding away in response to impersonal forces. But we have this divine thing in us and we'll, we'll fight you to the last over this last thing. It seems to me that we need to counterattack. Yeah. And without going the route of there's fairies at the bottom of the garden. Although it is the, uh, the most 
the most conservative Christians who are the most stressed out by Lewis's naiads and dryads. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when he infuses personality, spiritual personality, in, into his creation because he thinks he's imitating. He's imitating, although not, he's not trying to make any claims that there's naiads and dryads. He's imitating the, the personality that's present in this entire universe. Right, he's using a literary device from history to express the personality of the world. Yeah. Right? The spirituality of materiality, yeah. which is a fundamental Christian doctrine. That, you know, it, the word has created all things, and in Christ all things hold together. We can't see Christ, but all things are holding together in his creative and sustaining and redeeming word. That's the, that's the taproot of Lewis's belief in the, the literary utility of, of that trope of naiads and dryads. And then there's another thing that Lewis does that's refreshing in that his robust supernaturalism, so his defense of miracles, not, not miracles willy-nilly, not miracles every 10 minutes, but the, the full prerogative of God to intervene when it suits him with a miraculous thing that you cannot account for. So when I see Christians explaining the star of Bethlehem as a comet, you know, well, there was a comet that appeared. And I'd say, a comet showed them the way to the house? <laughs> <laughs> Either they're doing serious astrology on the back of a camel in the dark. <laughs> well, the back so, of a hummingbird. <laughs> <laughs> serious, for example. Serious mathematic. You know, no, no, carry the two. Turn left. I said. <laughs> well, it seems to me that you're in the midst of great, appealing to greater miracles than simply having a, having a star come down. I would just say, don't rule that out, though. <laughs> don't rule don't out rule the math. Out. Don't rule out some magi planting sticks in the ground and doing some shadow triangulation. <laughs> Don't, like, it's, and yeah, it would be amazing. I'd, I'd say that mirac the miracle is there regardless. However they knew, whether they phys like, yeah. whatever happened, it was miraculous, but that's to get too far afield. All right, so we've wandered into cosmology, um, <laughs> uh, postmodern versus modern. The Christian faith is not a variation of either of those. So we, uh, it's a, the Christian faith believes the cosmos is an integrated whole, uh, held together by Christ. There's personality throughout, not just Christ's personality, but subordinate personalities, angelic powers, celestial beings, creatures. And the other, th the other thing Fons. is... Fawns. <laughs> Fawns. Or the satyr spoken of. I was going to say, at least, yeah, say at, least, at least satyrs in the book of Isaiah. <laughs> so... Um, uh, and let's not, let's not, let's not, let's not, let's not. <laughs> and we won't even go to unicorns. And no, dragons. Sorry. And dragons, yeah. dragons there as well. Coonies. And satyrs yes. and unicorns. Leviathans. Yes. Yeah. So, Sparks in the nostrils. Uh, yeah. You guys have derailed me. <laughs> <laughs> We're still in cosmology. <laughs> so the point, the, the point is that Christ holds everything together. The cosmos is personal. It's suffused with glory. And I don't see how you can uh, aband uh, adopt sort of a quasi-deism out there, robust Trinitarian Christianity in my heart and in my head, to, you know, mm. and and survive and make it. Mm. There's got to be a there's got to be a counterattack, and Lewis is uh, relevant and will remain relevant, I think, for decades and centuries, precisely because he didn't budge. At the, very, at the places where the major onslaught was happening. Mm. And he's virtually the only one who didn't budge. Yeah. And one of the reasons he didn't budge is because he saw and understood very carefully the, the beginnings of this move in the 16th century, in the, in the wake of the Copernican Revolution, which you know, is, is the beginning of his magnum opus and of his study of the 16th century. And he points out how, you know, a, a, an astronomer like Kepler, at the beginning of his career in the 16th century, um, described the motions of the planets with respect to their anima motrices, you know, their motive spirits, their, their kind of angelic en engine room. But by the end of his career, Kepler was describing the motions of the planets uh, mechanically. And so a mechanistic paradigm had substituted for uh, an animistic one. 
um, you know, an animated view of the cosmos in which there were spirits. And you might say, well, that's, that's an advance because we, we can measure uh, on, on the mechanistic scale much more easily. And, and indeed, we can. We can describe we can, and yes. we think it's ex explanation. Y yes, but then we, we make that fatal error of, of mistaking the explanation for the, the real thing. So going back to 9.8 meters per second squared, if I developed a hypothesis that there were these things called graviton, gravitron fairies, and whenever I dropped an object, the nearest fairy would grab it yes. and haul it to the nearest larger object at 9.8 meters per second squared, and let's test my hypothesis. Um, and I measured, and I th thereby said, I've proven the existence of these fairies that you can't see. All, all I'm doing is describing yes. th describing what's happening. Yes. And then I've said, and, and I've given it a name, and you must bow down to the name because my description was accurate. Well, that's what we're doing with gravity. We have no idea what gravity is. And yet we persist in acting like we do. Yes. Right? We know what it does. We know what it does. We have given it a nickname. If it We can is. chart the tides. <laughs> But it's, but, but it's analogical. That's, yeah. that's Lewis's point in, in one of his writings that, you know, in, in the old view of the cosmos, the, uh, the idea of stones falling to earth or flames rising upwards was, was ascribed to the idea that every natural object had a, a natural home that it was desiring to get to. And a stone's natural home is the earth, that's why it falls. And a, a flame's natural home is the air, and that's why it rises upwards. And these movements uh, were described by analogy with, you know, birds flying home to their nests. Um, the planets themselves would, would incline with a, with a kindliness towards their kindred and then away again. Um, in the modern view of the cosmos, with the, the law of gravity, you have, you have an equally analogical situation, but we've, we've managed somehow to forget the fact that it is analogical. So, you know, when we say a stone falls in obedience to the law of gravity, we do not mean that the stone, becoming aware of its predicament, whips out a book of statutes, <laughs> turns to the page relevant to its situation, and decides that it had better be a law-abiding stone and come quiet. <laughs> and not, neither did medieval people think that stones felt homesick or felt at all. It's an analogy. It's a way of speaking about what we see, which makes sense to us, which, which gives us a, an inkling of meaning. Right. But both ways are analogical. Yes. And I'm with Chesterton on the tides, that's yes. all I have to say. Yeah, the materialist and the lover, Chesterton, sa Chesterton says, the materialist and the lover both associate the moon with the tides and with long lost love. But the only case either of them have is that they've seen them together. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Do I have an email? Uh, and here's, my, here's my question for the, for the materialists. When you hold a magnet next to a refrigerator and you feel the pull, how do they even know about each other? <laughs> it's like, how, how, when at one point does it become aware? Like, where, where does the awareness occur like which one's pulling on which and by what means and with what thing. It's like, like you can't grab onto nothing and pull mm. something. And this, and this is true in a vacuum. So they're not sending signals you know, across anything material, there's, uh, but there's a pull and you can feel it and you can measure mm. the strength of it and the force of it and you can even measure the strength of particular magnets based on how powerful they are when they pull. And we can even make them. We even, we even know how to create magnets and get them to pull at certain levels. And at the same time, not the faintest, when I'm holding my, my little seashell magnet yes. next to the refrigerator, it knows and it wants to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Boy, does it. And, uh, it's very mysterious, isn't it? It is, but no we're very casual. Though. We're materialistic yeah. pagans. We're very casual about all these mysteries around us all the time. Mm. But then if you say, but then if I answered the question, the reason it wants to attach to the magnet, to the, to the fridge, is Jesus. <laughs> yes. Every, everybody would say, oh, come on, oh, oh for pity's sake. But I, I remember taking a physics class when I was in college, and the professor was very solemnly explaining the, the atom to us. 
the electrons have a negative charge and the neutrons have no charge. And then you have a clump of, at the nucleus, you have all these protons that are all clustered together. Well, positive charges repel. So why are all these positive charged protons sticking together when they ought to be flying apart? And the, our instructor said, well, the thing that holds them together is what we call the strong force. Oh. <laughs> you meant Jesus. <laughs> As opposed to the weak force. Yeah, the strong force is what holds it all together. And in Christ, in Colossians, in Christ, all things hold together. It's, uh, we're, uh, and this is the point and where it's I... it's not joking or just trying to make a spiritual noise when it says that. It, right, it, it, it means, means it. something. We, what, why do I stick to the world when I walk? Why can I walk? Why does my car not fly off the road? Why, you know, why does everything cohere? Why do I have a world to live in? Why hasn't the moon flown away? Why, I mean, it's just any yeah. number of things, yeah. So, um, why is it round? <laughs> just perfectly I'm round. I'm asking, well, we're asking, you may as well. Yeah, well, not only why is the moon round, but why is it round and it's exactly the same shape and roundness of the sun? So, like, you're stacking a couple of quarters. Um, so, we're, we're, we live in this world that evidence, is, it's not just evidence of design in the contraptions of, you know, the flagella of the bac bacteria or, or, or the ankle, or there are these amazing engineering feats. But there's just the, the incredible mystery of the basic stuff of why everything sticks. Why it's all still here. Why it's all still here, yeah. Why, um, I saw a great t-shirt once, gravity, it's not just a good idea, it's the law. <laughs> 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 Which goes back to your point about nobody says I resolve today to try to stick to the ground better. No. Do a better job keeping the law of gravity. Yeah. But it's interesting that gravity, uh, originally meant simply weight. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, N Newton didn't discover the law of gravity. He, he gave a new uh, semantic depth of meaning to the word weight, so that we now have this law of weight, this law of gravity. Pattern of weight, yes. yeah, behavior of weight. Yes. Yeah. So if, um, let, let's wrap it up with this question. Uh, if we took the, the whole realm that we've been talking about, uh, modernity, post-modernity, metaphor, uh, the, the undergirding of all things by the Word of God, um, the, uh, the rejection or the resistance of um, a robust Christian faith to the materialist, secularist explanations of all things. Um, and if we said, we, I, I think we would all agree that one of the best guides out of our dilemma would be C.S. Lewis. Suppose someone came to Lewis not to, for an introduction to the Christian faith or not to have their imagination quickened, but what would you recommend? I'll ask the same thing, uh, Nate, of you. What would you recommend that, that a, a person who wants to get free of modernist cosmology do in approaching Lewis? So where would you recommend they go or where would they start in Lewis's corpus? You go first. I'd say, well, it depends. It depends on who they are and what they've read. I say, I, I think I'd just say Narnia. Okay. Um, immediately start with the start with the catechism. Right. <laughs> you know, just go through go through those a couple times. Have your questions. Right. It's like have your curi your curiosity addressed, and then you can move on into overt open discussion of those questions and those and those issues. I think that's the that's the the counter flavor. You know, the, the antidote is clearly incarnate narratives that are the opposite of the narrative that is being held in that person's head. So it's a, it's a rival story. Okay. You, tell the, you tell one story, a rival story, and then watch it affect and, and work, and then you can get into the actual just instructive discussion. But if you started with discarded image or something like that, if you, if you started with some of this... Uh, if you're talking about cosmology, yeah. worldview, not, not like mere Christianity, uh, although that would be excellent, um, I th I'd just start with Narnia. I'd probably start and finish with Narnia. Yeah, I think Narnia is a very good place to start. Um, not least because of, of what I believe that he was doing in those books. That is to say he was infusing into the whole of the story, the whole of the warp and the woof of the, of the text of each story, the, the plot, the character development, the ornamental details, he was infusing into all of that 
a spiritual personality, yeah. which was derived from the symbolism of the seven heavens, so that each story was flooded, irradiated with a spiritual presence, which he, Lewis, being so well informed <coughs> about the, 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 the spiritual symbolism of the seven heavens, was uh, fully equipped to do. And he's doing that because he believes that's a, a good imaginative rendering of the spiritual reality which obtains in the actual world, in which Christ's spirit is also flooding through everything that he has made. It, it doesn't usually announce itself in any particular uh, atom or, or person or event, though it is actually summed up in this one particular character called Aslan. Um, it does have an, in, an incarnation, uh, a local manifestation, but generally it's present in the whole of the rest of the, of the cosmos um, silently, implicitly. And only those who have ears to hear will hear it. Only those who have eyes to see will see it. And they need to have their eyes open and their ears attuned by getting into a personal relationship with this Jesus of Nazareth, who, who actually communicates his spirit to us. So we can begin to get on the wavelength of the universe. And that's all brilliantly imagined in Narnia, I think, by the imagery of the seven heavens, you know, uh, so then speaking we, through the whole of the story. Do you think we, we would the three of us agree that uh, Lewis was the author of the most subversive children's books ever? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Some of the most subversive books, full stop, not just children's books. Yeah. They are works of absolute genius. I, I think there's actually, I think that's just a matter of fact. I don't think that's, I don't think there's another book that could even contend. Mm -hmm. no. they don't, I don't think any have undercut or sub, like actually subverted, not just intellectually subverted, but succeeded in subverting culturally. When yeah. I've, uh, uh, my feel or observation of when I've taught my Lewis course, Discarded Image is one of the uh, books on it. But generally, the people for whom the discarded image is a, a revolution. Like in, uh, in, in my course, the students read Planet Narnia and they read Discarded Image, they read one of the Narnia stories. But overwhelmingly, when people have this shakeup uh, accomplished, or the coup de grace is the discarded image or Planet Narnia, it's because they were catechized. They, yeah. they, mm. they were steeped in the, um, the Narnian catechism growing up, and then someone said, and this is what makes it all. Somebody pushed over the first domino. Right, it yeah. all comes, oh, you know, that's the impact yeah. of this. Yeah. And if someone, just, of a typical modernist, if they read Discarded Image, the first thing of Lewis, what? this yeah. weirdo, what's yeah. this weirdo doing? Mm. You know, he's a scholar or an academic yeah. or a crazy man. I think also what you see with the Narnia Chronicles and the way that they do hang together on this, on this pattern uh, outlined in Planet Narnia, you watch the different influences and the, the tone, everything from the tone to the characters to moods, events, everything mapped out. Uh, it is really strange that one of the things I th I've, I've always found funny is the criticism of the Tolkien always leveled at Lewis for being in a rush and being sloppy and and uh, it really, it seems to me, it's just that Lewis cared about consistency in a different place than Tolkien did. Mm. So he didn't care about the phases of the moon in Narnia the way Tolkien cared about the phases of the moon yeah. in Middle Earth. Earth. But he, he cared about the soul of each book and he cared about the, you know, the, the tone of, of each of them. And he put together something truly fantastic. Mm. And I think its level of influence is hard to even measure. Mm -hmm. uh, because what are you going to do? Put a number on it? <laughs> you know, just, how do you, like, Seventeen how degrees do you, of influence. So, <laughs> uh, out of you know, how, how many novelists, how many how many writers and novelists and pastors and parents and teachers has Lewis affected and uh, shaped their dreams and imagination? It's just it's just yeah. countless. It's yeah. something that can't be. Right. And even that in that sense, even the movies help. Yes. Yeah, because they get people to read the books. the books. All things work together for good. <laughs> yes. Whoa. Yeah, for those. For those. <laughs> for those um, who. Yeah, I think the. Uh, well, I have a question for. One question, just a fan question, uh, Lewis fan question, for the cameras, for whoever's watching online. The correct order in which the book should be read <laughs> is, is, of course, of the course, order in which they were first published. Correct. Starting with the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Yeah. Yeah. Begin yes. at the beginning. Go on till the end and then stop. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Do not rearrange in the box set. <laughs> but the That's beginning amazing. is interestingly in the middle of the story, not at the start of the story. Yeah. That's where the true beginning is. 
Yeah. Of course it is, because the sphere is on turn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and on that uncontentious note, <laughs> we will uh, thank you all. Thank you, Michael, for being here with us. My pleasure. Thank you.